This is the Einstein-Hilbert action. The square bracket notation tells us that the action is a functional of the space-time metric. The constants on the right-hand side include the speed of light c and Newton's gravitational constant g. The integral extends over a region m of space-time. The space-time volume element is d4x square root of minus g, where g is the determinant of the metric. Finally, r denotes the scalar curvature. In this video, I'll show that the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action is given by this result, where big G mu nu is the Einstein tensor. It's useful to define the functional derivative as the coefficient of delta G mu nu in the integrand. So the functional derivative of the Einstein-Hilbert action is defined by the term in square brackets above. In general, the full action includes a contribution from the matter fields. The matter action depends on the matter fields, which I've denoted by a capital letter phi, and also the metric. The stress energy momentum tensor for the matter fields is defined by 2c over the square root of minus g times the functional derivative of the matter action with respect to the metric. By setting the functional derivative of the full action equal to zero, we have this result. This, of course, yields the Einstein equations, g mu nu equals 8 pi g over c to the fourth times t mu nu. Before we can show this main result, we'll first need to derive a few useful relations. First, we need the variation of the inverse metric. This follows from the identity g upper mu alpha g lower alpha nu equals delta mu nu. By varying this identity, we have the following result. We can now multiply through by the inverse metric g upper nu sigma. The highlighted terms yield the Kronecker delta, which in turn turns the alpha index into a sigma. After renaming some of the indices, this is our result expressing the variation of the inverse metric in terms of the variation of the metric. Our next task is to find the variation of the volume element, the square root of minus g. This can be found from Jacobi's formula, which says that for a square invertible matrix M, the variation of the determinant of M equals the determinant of M times the trace of M inverse times delta M. Jacobi's formula is not too difficult to derive. Start with the definition of the variation of the determinant of M as the difference between the determinant of the varied matrix M plus delta M and the determinant of the matrix itself. Now the determinant of M plus delta M can be rewritten as the determinant of M times the identity matrix plus M inverse times delta M. Recall that the determinant of a product of matrices equals the product of determinants. And now we can use the result, which isn't too hard to show, that the determinant of the identity plus a small matrix equals 1 plus the trace of the small matrix plus higher order terms. In this case, the small matrix is M inverse times delta M. Simplifying this result, we find that Jacobi's formula holds in the limit as delta M becomes infinitesimally small. Now we can apply Jacobi's formula to the metric to obtain delta G equals G times G upper mu nu times delta G lower mu nu. From here, it's straightforward to show that the variation of the square root of minus G equals 1 half square root of minus G times G upper mu nu times delta G lower mu nu. Next, we'll need to find the variation of the Christoffel symbols. Start with the definition of gamma mu alpha beta, then vary. Notice that the second line of this result is obtained by applying our expression for the variation of the inverse metric. Now the second line can be simplified using the definition of the Christoffel symbols. For the next step, we can use the definition of the covariant derivative acting on delta g mu nu. Rearrange this definition to obtain the partial derivative in terms of the covariant derivative and Christoffel symbol terms. Then use this to replace the partial derivatives in the variation of the Christoffel symbols. All of the Christoffel symbol terms on the right-hand side will cancel, leaving the following result. Note that delta gamma mu alpha beta is a type 1, 2 tensor. This is to be expected. If you write down the coordinate transformation rule for the Christoffel symbols, you'll see that the difference between Christoffel symbols, such as delta gamma mu alpha beta, transforms as a tensor. Now let's compute the variation of the Riemann tensor. Start with the definition, 
then vary. We can rearrange the definition of the covariant derivative of delta gamma mu alpha beta to rewrite the partial derivatives of delta gamma mu alpha beta in terms of covariant derivatives. The calculation is a little bit tedious, but what you'll find is that all of the terms that contain an unvaried Christoffel symbol cancel, leaving the following result. From here, we can easily find the variation of the Ricci tensor by contracting on the indices mu and nu. The variation of the scalar curvature contains two terms. The first term comes from the variation of the inverse metric, and the second term comes from the variation of the Ricci tensor. We can now use our result for the variation of the Christoffel symbols to write the variation of the scalar curvature explicitly in terms of variations of the metric. Now we are ready to vary the Einstein-Hilbert action. There are two terms. One comes from varying the square root of minus g. The other comes from varying the scalar curvature. Using the results below, we have the following expression for the variation of the action. The first two terms in the integrand combine to form the Einstein tensor, while the remaining terms form a total covariant derivative. The total covariant derivative has the form del alpha acting on square root of minus g times v alpha, where v alpha is the contravariant vector formed from the highlighted terms. Since the covariant derivative of the metric vanishes, the covariant derivative acting on the square root of minus g vanishes as well, and we can write the last term as square root of minus g times the covariant derivative of v. By expressing the covariant derivative in terms of partial derivatives, we have the following. Now use the definition of the Christoffel symbols, gamma, upper mu, lower alpha, beta. Notice that if we set the index mu equal to alpha, then the first and third terms cancel. So now the last term in the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action can be written this way. It's not difficult to see that this is just the partial derivative acting on the square root of minus g times v alpha. To verify this result, you'll need to use our expression for the variation of square root of minus g, where the variation is replaced with the partial derivative. This calculation shows that we can replace the covariant derivative in the last term with a partial derivative. So the last term in the variation of the action integrates to a boundary term. Now we assume that appropriate boundary conditions are placed on the variations of the space-time metric to ensure that the boundary terms vanish. This is actually a non-trivial part of the analysis. It's not immediately clear what quantities must be fixed on the boundary, but I'll save that discussion for another time. So the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action reduces to this expression, and the functional derivative of the action with respect to the metric is minus c cubed over 16 pi times Newton's constant times the square root of minus g times the Einstein tensor.